one of the wonderful friends of ours we've met over the years in the church, Sister Thetis Tenney, her husband, Brother Tom Fred Tenney. Many of you heard him preach at conferences around the world and all over the countryside for quite some time on the, on the Harvest Times program. But most of all, Sister Tenney is a down-to-earth Christian that loves the book, been baptized in his name and filled with his spirit, and she'll share with us today from her heart, through the word, the things that God wants us to hear. Let's say welcome, Sister Tenney. Welcome, Sister Tenney. God bless you as you minister to us today. Thank you, Brother Blackshear, and you may be seated. And when he said, love the word, that is the truth. I do love the word of God. I tell you, if you ever really get involved in studying the word, now the reason a lot of people don't like to read their Bibles is because they've never gotten into it enough to really enjoy it. But it's a fabulous book, just one of the most interesting in the world. And I'm going to just be sharing some very, uh, some things that are very meaningful. Did you get that turned on, Mr. Tenney? No, sir, I'm not mechanical. <laughs> now it is. There you got it. We wanted to get that on so we can get it recorded. Isn't that right? All right, thank you, Sister Tenney, very much. I'm a whole lot more comfortable at the kitchen table. <laughs> but uh, I, want, I do want to express one more time Brother Blackshear's indulgence of having me come on without my husband. That was a real risk. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I want to be very guarded in the kind of reports he gets back about my being here. And some of you ladies know what I'm talking about. Some of the benefits of our, our sessions would not impress my husband, uh, but they were beneficial. But on the other side, now some of you don't even know what we're talking about, but if you had been here, you do know that we discussed deep things like hairdos and things like that, you know. <laughs> but in addition to that, I do hope I have been able to, to leave with you some of what God has given me that has enriched my life so much. You remember that when Jesus said he was the way, truth, and life, he wasn't joking. He's the way of living. Without him, there is no life. He is the truth. Without him, there is no truth. Everything in this world is constant change. He alone, he alone and his word is the only thing that will never change. Everything else will pass away or will change. So he is the way, he is truth, he is life. Without him, there's no going. Without him, there's no knowing. Without him, there's no living. No living. And uh, he said, I, I am the way. He's already been there, come back. In fact, have you ever thought of how many round trips he's made to the world beyond? I mean, he was there, he came back down here, you know. Then he went back and he came back and he went back and he's coming back and he's going to go back. You know, it's pretty safe to follow somebody like that. Sure. He does know the way. He knows the way. And Jesus Christ is my very, very close friend. And I don't say that sacrilegious. I don't say that braggadocious. But he has become my friend. In view of the fact that this is uh, my father's, uh, as Brother Blackshear said, he was the pioneer here. And I really sincerely prayed about what to share with you today. I had not planned to share anything, but Brother Blackshear is too big to argue with. <laughs> and besides that, my husband has me so well trained that if a big man looks at me and says, do something, I say, yes, sir. <laughs> so uh, after he, he just kind of announced to me that I'd be doing this today, and I kind of politely and femininely tried to get out of it, but... Uh, he said no, so I said yes, sir. And uh, I, I just decided to share with you kind of my own motivating force of my life, philosophy of my life, and I think partly the reason was because of my dad, my mom, my sisters, all of their roots here. I have a tremendous heritage, not only in them, but in you. You're partly mine, too. And uh and this is really something that means a great deal to me. And very often, if I am in a place where I only have time to share one thing, uh, this is the 
the philosophy, scriptural philosophy I like to share. Now, I have many lessons that deal with this. And in fact, if you ever hear me very much, there will be very few lessons that I would ever teach that does not go back to our root in this scriptural philosophy. But if you will turn in your Bibles to Jeremiah 18, that's where we're going to start. And it's really kind of what puts life together for me and puts a lot of meaning in a thing, a lot of things that would be total confusion as far as I'm concerned. This is very familiar, first part of chapter 18 in Jeremiah. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. And that is such a familiar reading. Now, in all of the teaching and the preaching that you've heard through the years, you have often heard teaching concerning the potter. We can identify the potter, right? right. That's God. We know who the potter was. That's the person and character of God. We know who the clay is. That's me, and that's you. And really what he's saying is we are one undeveloped lump. That's us. That's me. But within that undeveloped lump, there is tremendous potential. And there is all kind of scripture that you can, you can read and study. I read some of them this morning uh, that deals with the fact that he can make vessels of this quality or that quality and for this purpose and for that purpose. And uh, I am an undeveloped lump, but I am a lump with a tremendous potential. And then, of course, you know the story of the potter's field. Now, that's the negative side of it. That's what happens if... The, the lump won't yield to the plan of the master potter. And that's the castaway thing. I don't want to talk about that today. I want to talk about the positive aspects of it. Now let us consider the factors that are involved here. There are some other things that we don't normally talk about. We talk about the potter, we talk about the clay, we talk about the potter's field. But we have forgotten that there is a thing called the wheel. There's the wheel. And if you've ever seen a potter work, uh, Chuck over here is from my, my, what would that be? My, we're, we're fathers and mothers and in laws uh, relatives. Yeah. My daughter in law's father was his pastor. And uh, Jeff, uh, Jeff Switzer, uh, who is my daughter in law's brother, fools with pottery. And uh, I got to watch a real crafted potter one time and it's really an interesting art to watch but a potter works with a wheel that's just as much a part of what they're doing as the clay not only do they have a wheel but the potter's hands become the tools for the molding so we've added two more factors to this story that was there all the time but we seldom think about them but there's the potter and there's the clay and we're going to forget about that castaway field but we want to talk about the wheel and the hands of the potter. They are very involved in the ultimate destiny of what happens to this undeveloped lump, right? right. Now, you know how the wheel works? The wheel spins like this, and it just goes round and round and round and round and round, and sometimes it goes fast, sometimes it goes slow, but it's very monotonous. Life's kind of like that. It's always spinning. Sometimes it's fast and sometimes it's slow and it gets awful monotonous at times. It really does. But it's a daily grind. Just as daily as the sun comes up, there's going to be the grind of life that day. You just can't go on living without going through one day at a time. That's right. I mean, I'd like to jump a few of them. Or back up a few, but it's that daily spinning of life that just goes round and round and round and round. And sometime I want to scream, stop the world, I'm ready to get off. But I can't ever find the brakes. And besides that, if I thought I was fixing to get off, I'd probably be saying, no, I, I changed my mind. You know. Okay, so we're going to talk, I want you to consider the wheel of life. 
And then the second thing that I want you to consider at this point is the hands of the potter. Now, if the wheel of the potter represents the daily grind of life, then the hands of the potter represent well the pressure against the wheel for the molding process. Now, there's a strange thing about potters. They want their wheel to go one way and their hands go the other way. Wheel goes around this way. And while the wheel is going this way, their hands are pushing this way. Because if they let it go this way, there would be nothing happen. So we not only have a master potter who has already predetermined. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. He knows what Amen. this lump of clay standing before you today has the potential of being. And he knows the plan. He knows where he wants me because in those days when they made them, they made them for a purpose. Hang on to that word, purpose. Purpose. He made them for a purpose and they were put in a particular place and they fulfilled a certain purpose and it, and it was a tremendous thing. Well, my potter knows what this lump of clay has the potential of becoming. That's right. And so he throws me on the wheel of life for the daily grind process. And while the wheel of life is going around, he also is applying pressure to me. Yes. And it's a purpose. Now, isn't that simple? It is so simple that you'll miss it if you aren't careful and interpret things in the scriptural way. So you can either simply go round and round with the spin of the wheel and remain a hunk of undisciplined clay and finally become hard and unpliable, or you can allow the pressure of circumstances and the spin of the wheel to mold you into the, the vessel of divine destiny that he planned for you. Amen. Amen. So the human, the human factor then is introduced. Now then, we've had the potter. We've got the clay. We're forgetting about the castaway field because it's unnecessary. That's right. It's absolutely unnecessary. Amen. Now, it is there. But this next factor I want to introduce you to will make the difference as to whether the castaway feel becomes a part of your life story or not. We have the potter, we have the clay, we have the daily grind of life, and we have the pressures of the circumstance of life that put pressure on us. And then is introduced the factor of the will. Right? Scripture tells us to make our calling and election sure. Did you know you have within your power to cast the deciding vote to whatever is your absolute destiny? God will not make it for you and the devil cannot make it for you. He has made you with the capability of deciding what your final destiny will be. Now, we like to slough that off because that's a tremendous responsibility. But there's always, two vote, always three votes involved in whatever you're doing. God's vote, the devil's vote, and your vote. And yours is the one that breaks the tie. Right. The devil always votes against you. God always votes for you. And you have to cast the deciding vote with what you will to do. And I do mean will. You choose to accept or reject God's calling for you. Amen. There's scripture in Jeremiah 21 says there's a way of life and death. You do the choosing. Haggai 1 says consider your way. You better give some thought to it. And I could just enumerate many things in the scripture where a will is introduced in a very subtle way and sometimes we don't recognize that that's the human will. The story of the talents. The human will is there. The story of the building of the house, the human will is there. I mean, you know, somebody in that story, when Jesus told about the story of building the house on the sand and on the firm foundation on the rock, you, you have to understand and feel this, but if you do, it sure helps a lot. But somebody decided they were going to build on an unstable foundation. Right. And somebody else decided, no, I'm not going to do that. And your will is a principal part that sometimes we 
evangelical Pentecostals have overlooked. Turn with me, if you will, to Philippians 2.13. I want to just show you a little scripture here that's very meaningful. Philippians 2.13. In your King James Version, it reads like this. Philippians, if you're not real familiar with your New Testament, let me let you find it. Corinthians and then Galatians and then Ephesians and then Philippians, Colossians, Philippians 2.13. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Now, bless King James. He had a tremendous group of people that put the King James Version together. But you remember this. It is still a translation of the original. And it was Old English. And sometimes it is not as descriptive to us as another translation. I want to read that scripture to you in Weymouth's translation. You have not to do it in your unaided strength, but you still have to do it. You just get aid. It is God who is all the while supplying the impulse. Uh, That's that uh, electoral card, and you punch yes or no. Now that's interpretation of that that little phrase giving you the power to resolve and the strength to perform the execution of his good pleasure you will to do you will to do now I want to turn with you to Romans 8 28 29 and I all of this is background for what I ultimately want to show you Romans chapter 8 Verse 28, verse 29. And this is so familiar. If you've been in church very long, I know you've heard this. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did, did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And if you're like most of us who are not theologians, By the time we got down to that word, those big words, foreknow and predestinate, we didn't even know what we were talking about. Now, that's just being honest, isn't it? Sounds good, but I mean, you've got to do some thinking to figure that out. That's why I like translations. Let me read you a couple I've got jotted in in the margin of my Bible. Those whom he called and responded... He is making all things conspire to make them into his image. Now listen to another translation. We are gradually transformed into the same likeness. We are being transformed. We are being transformed. I thought there was another phrase there. But what that is saying is, you know, we love this, Romans 8, 28. We know all things work to get together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. You know what we use that for? We use that as a pacifier. But when I need something, I need more than a pacifier. And when, when things are going against me and I've got a lot of pressure bearing down on me and life is tough and the wheel is spinning fast, and the, there's been a lot of hard rocks discovered in this lump of clay. And, uh, and there's a lot of pressure being put on me. And you come around and pat me on the back and say, Oh, honey, don't worry about it. You know everything works together for good to those that love the Lord. Please give me a little more than that. I need that last phrase. All things work together for good to those who are called to them who are called according to his purpose. We know all things work together for good to them that love God, but they don't work together just that simply unless you realize that you have been called for a purpose. You know, if life doesn't have a purpose, it's very confusing. And if you don't know the purpose of being a Christian, you're going to live a frustrated life and never have any joy and victory. There is an eternal purpose to the call of God on your life. And all this business of living life, all this business of God calling me, all of the circumstances he puts on me. And, you know, he's told me such things as when somebody smites me on one side of the face, I'm supposed to turn the other side. And I don't like that. 
And he's told me when somebody really mistreats me, I'm supposed to pray for them. And that when I meet hate, I'm supposed to respond with love. Now, you know, that makes wonderful preaching, Brother Blackshear. But when you put it in shoe leather, you've got to have a reason why that makes sense. I mean, it doesn't make sense unless you understand that there is an eternal purpose. He has called me for the eternal purpose. And it's great. Turn to Ephesians 1. And I, I, I'm going to read this. And, and please, please hang on with me right here. And I'm going to, if you don't, I know people have a way of when you start reading scriptures, tuning you out. You believe I'm a people? I understand that. Verse 3, where is that, where I want to start? Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that sh we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Here's some more of those big words. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, and on down and look at verse 11, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Now there's a lot of big reading in there, but there's three words I want to pull out and mention to you. You notice that the word will and the word chosen and the word purpose reoccurs over and over and over. If you ever get what I am going to talk to you about from this point forward, and it is so simple that I could, if I didn't like to use a lot of words, I could probably do it in about two or three minutes. But to help you understand a little more, I'm going to take a little more time than that. If you will get what I'm going to talk to you about, the eternal purpose of God, a personal understanding of the eternal purpose, it is going to solve all of the problems of what happens on the spin of the wheel of life and all of the pressures that he is applying to your life to mold you into what he wants you to be. Now, before I go on into the eternal purpose, let me tell you what the potter's hands do. The potter's hands not only are applying pressure to push that vessel into the shape that it's supposed to be. And by the way, the shape you're supposed to be in is a shape like Jesus. You're supposed to become a little Jesus in this world. That's not sacrilege. But the potter's hand, at the same time he's pushing that into that shape, he is feeling for imperfections. And he finds these little grits and gravels and imperfections and impurities. And you know what he does? He just pulls them out and it hurts. And the pressure that is applied to life is the way those things are exposed. How do I know I am not filled with the love of God? I'll tell you how I know I'm not. It's when you walk up to me and just really give me a cut down and something rises up in here that wants to cut you right back. And so he puts me in life with all of these abrasive people around me. <laughs> And they show the grit. I mean, you know, I can stand in church and testify and appear to be so silky smooth for Jesus. But on the job, when somebody else gets the promotion that I had worked for, and in the neighborhood, when somebody does something to my child, when that little angel could not possibly have been responsible. And in the church... When my dear sister really has some ugly words for me. That's the pressures of life, friend. And you cannot escape them. But if you can see that there is an eternal purpose, it makes you able to take all of that. Now the eternal purpose is, and I just read it in Ephesians, and you can go back and check it. 
It's a lot of reading. But the eternal purpose is he has destined me to come into his inheritance. He has foreordained. The word predestinated is he has foreordained. He does not act on that foreknowledge because my will is involved. But his plan for me is when I was born to Johnny and E.W. Corrin in Bonweir in 1934, fooled you, you didn't think I was that old, 1934, in a little old tiny town by, bon, by the name of Bonweir, he knew that that little lump of clay had tremendous potential not only for life but for eternity. And he said, look at her, how wonderfully she's made. Oh, you say, that sounds egotistical. That's scripture. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm made in his image. Did you know in this brain that's between my two ears, the mind of Christ can operate? That's all scripture. It's tremendous potential. It's a great thing. So he says, she has a great life in front of her. Look what she can do for the kingdom and what she does for the kingdom will never pass away. And then once she has gone through this training program of this earthly job, I have a promotion for her and in the eternity that is to come, that little darling is going to rule right over here Hallelujah. in my cabinet. Isn't that beautiful? Not because I said it, but isn't that motivating? And so what happens? He throws me on the wheel and starts it spinning and starts applying all kind of pressures because he knows that the power that I'm going to have when I inherit my inheritance with him and sit with him in heavenly places and rule and reign with him, he knows that I have to be very disciplined and purified and matured for all, for it to be safe to give me all of that. He is not doing all of that to hurt me. He is cheering me on. He is my father and he takes good pleasure in me doing his will. I've already read it to you. When I come in with a report card that's good, I've just gone through a test and he and I've I've made a good grade. He is more happy with me than I ever was with one of my children because he says she's on her way. On her way. She's on her she's going to make it. She's got she's got the grit out. She's 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 coming on. Now my my teaching's really very simple. And I don't ever want to lose my child likeness at the wonder of his word and his ways. Jesus didn't say be childish, but he did say be childlike. And childlikeness is never losing the wonder, never losing the joy that puts a skip in your step, right. never losing the thrill right. of discovering right. something new. Amen. And this keeps me going, my friend. Yeah. It has set my course a long time ago and pointed my consciousness in an eternal direction. And I know where I'm going. By his help and grace, you say, you sound awful cocksure about it. You sound a little bit egotistical and cocky. Well, I am just depending on his grace. If he is not able to save me, I sure can't save myself. And if he's already made several round trips up there and he's going to make a few more if I follow him, it's a sure thing. Sure thing. Amen. Being saved is not difficult. Saved. Bending my will sometime is. But that really is not difficult either if you just set your head. Amen. You have total control of your will. Have you ever heard of guilt transferal? If a person feels real guilty about something, you know what they do? They implicate or they blame somebody else. That's why in our communication sometimes we say, you make me so mad. No, you cannot. You don't have the power to make me mad unless I choose to react that way. I choose. That's my will. So your will is totally yours and you just can blame it on a whole lot of other things, but your will, God gave it to you so you could will to do His good pleasure. And He gives you the Holy Spirit so that you will be aided in that response to His will. Is this making sense to y'all? The Holy Ghost won't do it for me, but I told the group, I think it was this week or last week, I've forgotten. 
But I told them the other day that the Holy Ghost is like the power steering on an automobile. Shout all day long, you've got it, but if you don't engage it, you'll have a wreck. But it's that will that turns it. And then the Holy Spirit does it for you. Right. But it will not do it until you have bent your will. That is right. That is you mistreat right. me, and immediately, unconsciously or consciously, I decide how I'm going to react. The minute that I willfully decide that I will react like Jesus, then the Holy Ghost kicks in and helps me, and you will find that it becomes so easy that you wonder why you haven't done it that way before. Well, I get real excited talking about this. But this makes so much sense to me, and it helps me in so many ways. And to tell you the truth, I have no idea where I am on my notes right now. <laughs> I just get excited talking about it. And when I tell you that it has become the philosophy of my life, I really mean it. I really mean it because you can start interpreting every event that happens in your life by this philosophy. That's right. Okay, what happened today? Now, Lord, I didn't like this. I don't like what I'm facing. Now, what is the purpose in this? What in me are you trying to develop? You have given me an enormous responsibility, Lord. You're sending me to Alaska without my husband? I am committed to his will. There is nothing that can happen to me if I am committed that he will not either send to me or make it work for me even if it came from the devil. Paul said that. He said, the devil sent this thing to me to destroy me. I'm going to bend it, use it. It'll bring glory. And so everything that happens, you give me a big responsibility. I don't know whether I can do that or not. I trust him. And I say, now, Lord, what are you doing? I don't know what he's doing down, down the road, but he's, he's doing something. So I just trust him, and I go along, and he supplies the strength for me to do his will. You've had a bad day, and you say, I don't know why this had to happen to me. So you say, Lord, what are you trying to work out in me? And then you look and you see, uh-huh, I was a little bit jealous in that situation. Found a little grit there, didn't you, Lord? Got to get it out because I don't want to go over in the field. Jeremiah 18 is the story of the developing clay. Jeremiah 19 is the story of the clay that wouldn't be developed, broken pottery. Well, it works, and it's great, and it's simple. The ways of the Lord are not hard. They are simple. Now I want to give you a little illustration that, that has helped me a great deal. I've used it for many, many years. You see, we know what we ought to do. Because we've heard it preached. We know how to do it. But until you understand the why, you have no motivation. Now, an illustration of that. Little boy, his dad comes in one evening from work and he says, Son, I want you to clean out the garage. You know, simple thing, clean out the garage. He comes in from work the next day, the garage isn't cleaned out. If you have a son, you understand this. And so, so the dad says, now, son, I need you to clean out the garage. And dear, wonderful, loving father that he is, he says, maybe, you know, to himself, he says, well, maybe the kid doesn't know how. So he says, come on out here, and I'll show you what I want done. Now, you see all this? You stack this up here, and you do this, and you throw this away, and you rake this out and do, you know. Okay, now the kid knows how as well as what. He knows what to do. He knows how to do it. Dad comes in the next day. Son, why do you clean out the garage? I mean, we have all kind of silly excuses, yeah. you know. So the dad says, now look, son, to, tomorrow afternoon I am bringing home a new car, and I want the garage clean so we can put the new car in the garage. Makes a lot of difference when you understand why the garage needed to be cleaned. And you know what you're supposed to do as a Christian. You even know how. Turn the other cheek. Pray for those that despitefully use you. Submit yourself to authority. You know all of that. But if you understand why, it takes all of the negatives out of it. 
and the reason that I am disciplining myself to try to react in every situation like Jesus Christ would react is because he has got an eternal purpose planned for me. And that is that I will come into the inheritance and rule and reign with him. Did you know there are going to be actual human beings? Now we will have a new body. But there are going to be people who have walked on feet of clay in this earth and lived in life like I have that are actually going to rule and reign in the world to come. Amen. Amen. I mean, heaven's not going to be floating around on a little cloud somewhere bored to death for 10 million years with nothing to do. I don't want to go. That's what it's like. Wouldn't that be horrible? I mean, have you thought of that? Sometimes all we can think about is just getting out all this work. But have you ever thought of spending 10 million years doing nothing but laying around on a cloud? <laughs> no, listen. If man's ingenuity and the, and the uh, creativeness of God has made the complexity and the innovativeness and the technology and the interest, and the beauty, and all of the activity of this world, what do you think that perfected world with perfected beings is going to be like? It's going to be something else. And he speaks of a kingdom, and he speaks of people ruling and reigning. You take these cities, and you take these, and you take this. Brother Blackshear, you can just do anything you want to with all of Alaska. You're the governor up there. Run it like you want to. You know, that we're really going to rule and reign? Hallelujah. Speaks of people coming up to Jerusalem. Still going, I hope I'm not in here. You go right ahead. There's going to be some wonderful things happening. But that's why I will discipline myself to him is because he's got a place planned for me. And it, if I know why he's doing all this and requiring all this, it sure makes it a lot better. Makes it Let me tell you another story about another little boy. That little boy was taken to a parade by his, uh, his father. And uh, parades are wonderful. You know, there's all kind of excitement and, and everything. And so the dad was just enjoying it. And the little kid kept whining and pulling. and Sounds familiar, doesn't it? You know, jerking on you. Hold me, I want this, I want that, I want something else. And the dad couldn't figure it out because the floats were beautiful and there was bands and activity and they were, you know, all kind of things going on. Till suddenly he, he leaned down to where the little boy was to see what he could do for him and realized that all the little kid was seeing Well, you know. So the dad understood then that the little boy was frustrated. He didn't know what all the excitement was about. So he took him, climbed the stairs to a balcony that was overlooking the street, and then the little kid got all excited. You ever heard the scripture in Ephesians about sitting with him in heavenly places? Amen. Did you know that a good understanding of the word and the why and climbing above the clamor of all the activity here? You see, activity can dull your aim and motion can dull your motivation unless you have a good, clear understanding. But if you can understand that he has a purpose, there is an eternal purpose in everything that has to do with the kingdom of God now. It is planned to coupled with that kingdom that is to come. And then it takes the frustration out and the excitement comes to you. You are not saved just from sin, although you are saved from sin. But that's not the end. You see, if we limit ourselves by just, if in this life only we had hope, we would be of all men miserable. And I promise you, that if there was not an eternal consciousness and an eternal purpose, trying to live like Jesus Christ would really not make a whole lot of sense in this dog-eat-dog -dog world. But I'm coupling to something a whole lot beyond that. I am not only saved from sin, I, have, I am saved unto Him. Unto Him. I belong to Him. And so we have the eternal 
purpose of God, the motivating force that keeps us going and helps us to understand what life is all about anyway. Acts 11 and 23 said that with purpose of heart, they clave. Purpose of heart gives you a glue consistency. If you can get a hold of the eternal purpose, you can cleave, and that word cleave means glue. It gives you something to hold on to. It's that nail in a sure place that Brother uh, Glover pro preached about the other night. It is a wonderful feeling of attachment to something that's firm yes. if you have a purpose, yes. an eternal purpose. And as he is, so shall I be in that world that is to come. Now, Jesus Christ is our pattern. But Paul also said he was a pattern. And I am to become a pattern. Now turn with me to Philippians again, if you will. Philippians chapter 3. And I'm just about to finish this up. Paul had a purpose. He had a pull. And he had his priorities straight. Verse 10, 12, and 13, and 14. Now the purpose was, Paul says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. I want to know him. I want to be conformed into his likeness. Verse 12 shows us the pull. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which I also am apprehended of Christ. I wish I had a translation that I have at home and I can't quote it, but what that scripture saying in 1984 English is, he said, now I haven't reached what he's aiming for me to reach, but I am going after it and I'm going to get it because Jesus Christ has a purpose for me. And then verse 13 and 14 is his priorities. I cannot, I count not myself to apprehend it. I haven't made it yet. But this one thing I do, I am not going to let all the mistakes I made behind me stop me. This is my translation. You won't find that in the King James. And reaching forth unto those things which are before, I have some tremendous goals in front of me that I am reaching for. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now, a lot of people think that means simply that Paul said, if I can just get to heaven, I'll be so happy. No, what he was saying is, the Lord saw tremendous potential in me. I haven't reached my total potential yet, but I'm after it. And I am going to reach the prize of the mark of the high calling. The highest mark I can make in life if for Christ Jesus, I'm going after it. Hallelujah. Going after Amen. Hallelujah. Now turn back with me to Romans chapter 8 and verse 29. We read those a while ago, but I want you to see that verse 29 actually comes before verse 28 in your thinking. Whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Do you know Jesus is my elder brother? And big brother has already gone the path before. And I can follow him. And I can be like him. And the scripture here is talking about that deal that I was talking about, that molding and pressure process. Whom he did decide or determine and he decided all the world could be saved if we will to do so he is going to put pressure on us to conform us into the image of his son uh turn with me to Ro romans 12 i think it is yeah verse 2 and it follows verse 1, which you're very familiar with. Let me read it, though. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, you know, you can read that with a negative sound. I don't like negative living. It's, it doesn't work. You'll live under pressure, stagnate, get nervous, neurotic, and nobody will want anything you've got. Sure, there's sacrifice. Sure, I present my body. But if I know why I'm doing it, 
it takes the bad negative out and I can take, I can endure it for a while to enjoy the future. Verse 2, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Did you know this is saying that we are conformed, are being pressured, pressured, transformed. We're being pressured into a likeness of Jesus Christ so that we can prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You are transformed so you can prove. Now, I can have a tube of toothpaste. It can say toothpaste. I like Crest. Not that new mint flavor, the old time kind. Crest. I can say Crest on it. I can believe it's Crest. But you know how I'm going to find out for sure if it's Crest? When I put pressure on it. We are transformed to prove what is the good and acceptable perfect will of God. The perfect will of God is that you be a little Jesus in this world to inherit the world that is to come and rule and reign with Him. And so He puts pressure on us to expose what's in us to get us ready so we can safely rule and reign with Him. Does that make sense? Very simple. Very simple. And it is a tremendous motivating force. Now let me show you how you do all this. How all these words conform, transform, you know, pressure. What what is all that, Sister Jenny? I, I try hard and then I fail. And well, it takes a little willpower. God will never negate your will. Never. Never. Right. Come on. Under no circumstances will he violate human will. But I'm gonna tell you what I can do. You know anything about pouring concrete? I don't know a whole lot about it, but I fool with building some. And, and I know that before you pour concrete, you have to build a form. Yes. 